There's only a couple times from here until Jesus' public ministry that we see anything about Jesus um, as a child. One of the things in the text that stuck out today that Marcia was so gracious to read for me so I could preserve what little bit of voice God has given me today is this. <clears throat> in quotes, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord in verse 23. I started to go back into Exodus and look at Exodus 13 at what this meant. And I, I dug through, and there's a few things we'll look at today, and then we'll talk a little bit more about how we apply these things to our lives. Exodus 13, verse 1 through 3. Then the Lord said to Moses, quote, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. Then Moses said to the people, Commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Going down just a little bit. This observance, in verse 9, this observance <clears throat> will be for you. Actually, I'm sorry, verse 8. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep his ordinance at the appointed time, year after year. goes on to say in verse 12, You're to give over to the Lord every first offspring of every womb. All the males of your livestock belong to the Lord. As I read through these things the other night, and sometimes, look, when I go into the Old Testament and the Torah, I read it, I get it, then you have to like really look at the context of where everything was being spoken and the purpose God was speaking it to the people and to us today. As we look at this, we see that, uh, that it's, this is one of the ones that's so very direct. It doesn't say that the males were able to be strong enough on their own to break away from slavery in Egypt, but no, they're reminded that it was the power of God, that God used Moses to speak the words needed to Pharaoh, to speak the words needed to take them from where they were in captivity, to be allowed freedom, to allow the sparing of their children, and now yet uh, to, be, to be in freedom. As we look at the text, we see that they're to remember the power of God through this year after year after year after year. Probably, if I remember my Old Testament, something like eight, nine hundred, I don't know, years. Several, about a thousand years or so later. We see that this is still being observed. And we see that Jesus was born, and as Jesus was born in, in, into the conditions he was, Mary and Joseph wanted to fulfill every law of Moses, law of God. They wanted to make sure that Jesus had all the sacraments done as prescribed through the Old Testament so Jesus could have every prophecy fulfilled. Okay, that's fine. Now we're going to move on from that. There was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. He wasn't young, right? He'd been waiting a long, long time to see what God was going to do. But yet, he continued. And as we look down at the bottom here of the text, we see Anna also, same thing, in the temple every day, worshiping God, serving God, seeing the movements of God, 
trusting that God was going to do what God said he would do. I wonder how it must have felt that day for Simeon to wait for the movement of God and then see this child come. I wonder what it would have been like for the people around him because there's myself as a younger person. Am I okay being younger? I'm like in the middle of life now. Myself as a self-proclaimed younger person still. I, I, I look at people who have gray hair and I look up to you because you have wisdom. You have experience in life that yet I do not have, but maybe I learn from you as I walk through life. I can remember your stories and see how God worked in your life, and it may be an experience thing for me to where I can use your teaching or your experience and apply it to situations I have. I share this for this reason. I wonder how many young people were observing Simeon and Anna. I wonder how many young people observed them for several reasons. Maybe one for their faith. Maybe two for their, their servant heart. Maybe three they were observing them for their, is this even a word? stick to Is that a word? Where I come from. I wrote it in a letter actually. To the, I think I used that in a in a paper in school last month. Maybe that's why I didn't get such a great grade on that one. Oh well. stick to Okay, in my words, Urban Dictionary would possibly say, an act of sticking to something, even though maybe others would say you shouldn't stick to it. It'll probably be in there next week. Quote my name next to it. We see that, we see that they had these qualities that well, I'm guessing even 2,000 years ago, people had these words. Ah, this new generation, they just don't have what the old generation had. We've never said that before, right? Okay, look, I'm getting to the age where I'm starting to say it, so. <laughs> All things shall come to pass. The eyes have viewed, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepare in the sight of all nations, Simeon says, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The Holy Spirit was on Simeon. The Holy Spirit was also speaking through the angel, uh, as we remember, to the Magi. The Holy Spirit was speaking to the shepherds. The Holy Spirit had spoken to Joseph. The Holy Spirit had spoken to Mary and also given uh, Jesus to Mary. As we see the Holy Spirit at work, we now see the Holy Spirit is working and guiding everything to where God needed people to be. Now the sermon title today, if I could find my bulletin up here, is one that, that probably is just like a stick to it statement. I think it's a fragmented run-on sentence, but that's okay. God places leaders at certain times in certain places. Maybe not run on. But look, the truth of the matter is the same yesterday as it is today as it will be tomorrow. God puts certain people in leadership at certain places in certain times for certain reasons. God kept Simeon and God kept Anna going because he needed their faith to be evidenced so that others could see it and they could come closer to God and that they would be hearing every word that they spoke and when they spoke that this is the Messiah, my eyes have seen the salvation of God. As they started to say this, the young ones, the other ones started to hear and their faith began to increase. Anna, as we see, she was widowed and in the way the text is written, she was a widow until she was 84. She'd been many years. She'd been many, many years a widow. The old, the Bible before Jesus' time shows us the treatment of widows and orphans to be the least of these. 
kind of a castaway, a social outcast, if you will. Remember Jesus' words on the cross when Jesus was dying. Seven last phrases or words Jesus spoke. One, he said to John, Son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. Jesus, in a way, gave adoption of Mary, Mother Mary, who now Joseph had gone and he'd gone on and he give Mary to John so that she would not be widowed without a child, a male to take care of her. What we see here is that Anna, Anna would have been a least of these, but yet she served and loved God. It wasn't about her worldly situation she was in. It was about what God was doing in her life. And it was about how God loved her and cared for her so much. In Ezekiel 34, around the 10th verse, you'll see, and I'm not going to go read through the whole chapter of chapter 34 of Ezekiel, but that's your homework. You can thank me later. Ezekiel 34 gives you two types of leaders. It gives you one type of leader who was all about their self, self-serving. And this leader of Israel would have been devouring the people, hurting people. Absorbing all they could for their self. Self-interest was the greatest thing. Then it goes on a little further in Ezekiel 34 to talk about a different kind of leader. We know that the different kind of leader would be the Christ. We know the different kind of leader was the love that God would show to humanity. In spite of how humanity has treated God and treated each other. See... I guess my point is simple. That's all you're going to get out of me today is a very simple, hopefully one point. My point is this. God puts certain people in leadership places for purposes that are God's. If we're in a place of leadership, and in fact all of you are, because all of you are called to lead people to know Jesus Christ, if you're in a leadership position, which means you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you can share that with others. Or you can hold on to it tight and not believe that that gift is big enough to share with someone else. I had this great thought today. And due to the fact that I've been really, really wore down under the weather this week, I wasn't able to prepare it. But I want to share it with you so spiritually you can share with what this great, great vision was that I didn't get to put together. I was going to have little plaques made up for every one of you. Some of you have been in actual leadership in the church. Some of you were in leadership here 30 years ago, never to step back into leadership again. Some of you have been in leadership this past year. Some of you are willing to step into a leadership position in the year coming. Not knowing what that means, but just saying, okay, we'll see how things go. I also pictured the church being completely full today and the weather being about 55 degrees and sunny. And that didn't happen either. But what I wanted to do today was I wanted to honor each of you. I wanted to honor each of you because even if, even if things didn't work out exactly the way you felt they should in the leadership role you were in, God used each and every one of you. Coming up the road today, I actually shared in the car, see, I used to ride to church by myself. I talked to myself. I wouldn't have anybody to share uh, common sense with me. Now that I'm married, it's great. If I hear voices in the car, it's not something I need to be worried about now. But I said, boy, it was even over the Christmas Eve uh, gift that, that, that you all give to me as a pastor. 
I said, I didn't deserve any of that. I, I'm grateful. Hear me out. I'm grateful. But I don't feel the church is where it needs to be right now. And I'm the one that's been here. And then the voice in the car said, the church is a lot further down the road now in a better, different place than it was even a few months ago. I take this as a moment of confession to you. I take this as a moment of also humbling myself before God. Because in 2018, there's one way the church is going to continue to get rebuilt and grow. There's no human leader that's going to change this church and make it good. We got a good building. Other than the fact that the heater in the hallway is different than in here. And dude, selfishly, I left the door closed so I wouldn't get a chill, okay? I'm so sorry. But look. There's no, we got a good building. We got a good facility. You got a great church. The way it's going to become greatness, a movement of God, a holiness movement, is by us not looking to the power of ourselves as leaders, but being on our knees. See, neology, when we're praying, when we're praying, and we're like Simeon and Anna, and we're, we're asking God, God, and God is speaking, saying, I will do this. We don't have to ask God, pin him down for a timeline. We have to trust God, do our minimal, very small part as humans, and keep looking up to the cross. The best leaders out there are the ones who are the most humble. We've all seen different leaders of different kinds. In fact, I'll just share this. I watched Gladiator three times this week because the remote control was not next to me. And I didn't feel like getting up. There's a very contemporary example that you don't have to be in the spotlight to create change. Remember is that fictional story of Rome, the Colosseum. Remember, what was his name? I can't remember his name now. The fellow that, Ru that Russell Crowe played. Remember that, yes, Maximus, thank you. You were watching the same show I was three times in a row. Remember, he was enslaved pretty wrongly. He had a choice to make. To be humble and to see what could happen through him. Grant it wasn't the Lord our God, but to see how he'd be used. And to see the change in community. Very good example. I'm not asking any of you to become martyrs this week. But I'm asking you to submit yourself to God. To trust him, to love him. And know that the greatest leaders are the ones who serve the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and all their strength. And I thank God for every one of you that served on finance, on ad council, on trustees, on SPRC. My God, you made it over a year. You know that, right? I thank God for, there you go, SPRC. I, there's a whole bunch more you I forget. I can throw in Boy Scouts, right? See, there's community things going on, and all of you are part of building community. So let's keep loving God, loving neighbor as self. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time, and I thank you for the, I thank you for the, well, look, Lord, I thank you for giving me my voice for 20 minutes. It's all I prayed for all week. So God, as we start into this opportunity for communion, Lord, I ask that you would just help us to, to love you with all of our heart. Lord, allow us to be humble. Allow us to be humble in a way, God, that's real. Humble in a way, God, that we can be leaders like Simeon and Anna. Humble God in a way that we can serve you every day in the temple courts. 
and outside the temple courts, seeing God what you're going to do. So in Jesus' name and Jesus' love, I pray for this community. Amen.